Asleep to sing, Jesus. 
Well, good morning, everyone. So good to see everyone out there today gathered together for worship on this Good Shepherd Sunday. Grateful to have uh, Bishop Julian Dobbs, our bishop, with us today, who will be preaching the word from the Gospel of John. 
And uh, so I'm grateful for this opportunity for all of us to gather here uh, together uh, this morning. And I pray that the presence of the Holy Spirit will be with you in your homes and the various places uh, that you're gathered this morning uh, for worship. Let's take a moment to quiet our hearts and still ourselves before the presence of the Lord. If you have a copy of the Book of Common Prayer with you on page 123 of the Book of Common Prayer. Alleluia! Christ is risen! The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia! Joining our voices together, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. O God, whose Son Jesus Christ is the good shepherd of your people, grant that when we hear his voice, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from Nehemiah, chapter 9, beginning at the first verse. Now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth, and the, with earth on their heads, and the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquity of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it, they made confession and worshiped the Lord their God. 
On the stairs of the Levites stood Jeshua, Bani, Cadmiel, Shebaniah, Bunai, Sherebiah, Bani, and Kanani. And they cried with a loud voice to the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Jeshua, Cadmiel, Bani, Abishaniah, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Shebaniah, and Pethahiah said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. You are the Lord, the God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made him the covenant to give to his offspring the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, and the Girgashite. And you have kept your promise, for you are righteous. And you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry at the Red Sea and performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants and all the people of his land. For you knew that they acted arrogantly against our fathers and you made a name for yourself as it is to this day. And you divided the sea before them so that they went through in the midst of the sea on dry land and you cast their pursuers into the depths as a stone into mighty waters. By a pillar of cloud you led them in the day, and by a pillar of fire in the night to light for them the way in which they should go. You came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them right rules and true laws, good statutes and commandments, and you made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them commandments and statues and the law by Moses your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought water for them out of the rock for their thirst. And you told them to go in to possess the land that you had sworn to give them. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. This morning's psalm is Psalm 23. You'll find it on page 295 in your prayer book. We'll read the King James Version in unison. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. For his, his name's, name's sake. sake. Yea, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou, thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they, they comfort me. You prepare the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Amen. Our second reading is from Peter's first letter, chapter 2, verses 13 through 25. Again, that's Peter, chapter 2, beginning at the 13th verse. 
be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Our sequence hymn this morning is Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
This morning's gospel is written in the book of John, chapter 10, beginning at the first verse. John, chapter 10, beginning at the first verse. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, I know that the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Will you now join me in prayer? Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep within us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the light of Christ may be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O Lord, and fulfill in us all the purposes of your glory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It's a great joy to be with you at Bishop Seabury and to have those from Christ Church joining and other places too. I see many familiar faces on the screens this morning. Have you noticed that the world in which we live is an exceedingly hostile place and a dangerous place for the Christian? There are perils on the right hand and on the left, both within and without. We have the world, we have the devil, and we have the sin that is within us, all opposing us. And so there are snares set for our feet to entangle us, and there are various means through which the devil and the world around us seek to bring us captive into the devices of sin. No doubt, like me, you know all of those things. This is a very dangerous place. And if we're left alone in this world and fend for ourselves, it would be the worst possible news that we could ever have. But in this morning's gospel passage, we are assured and reassured that we are not alone. Even though we are vulnerable sheep, and even though there are many perils and dangers around us, we have a shepherd, a good shepherd. 
Think about shepherds in the Bible, if you would. We've heard about them in our Bible readings this morning. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Isaiah uses the imagery of a shepherd in Isaiah chapter 40, where he prophesies about Jesus, the Messiah. He says, he shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. It's beautiful. Remember, too, it was the shepherds who received the angelic declaration at Christ's birth in the Bethlehem fields. The picture of the sleepless, self-sacrificing shepherd with his staff in his hand, devoted to watching and protecting and leading and feeding his sheep. It's a beautiful picture, and it ends up becoming a picture of Jesus, who says himself, I am the good shepherd. There would have been echoes, too, for Jesus' listeners of the downside of the Old Testament shepherd picture, the false shepherds of Ezekiel 34 and Isaiah and Jeremiah, Israel's former leaders who had badly let their people down, those leaders who had failed to care for them and to nurture them, those leaders who are only looking out for themselves, who put themselves first and forgot about the flock. In fact, they used the flock to their own advantage. But Jesus is the fulfillment of that Old Testament promise to appoint a new shepherd, prefigured in King David, completed in Jesus. Jesus the Lord is my shepherd. He is our shepherd. The chapter from which our gospel reading is taken, from what Stan read to us, is taken from some of the best-known verses in the Bible, where Jesus refers to himself as the Good Shepherd. He also calls himself the gate or the door. Beautiful pictures of the strands of authentic Christianity, the real thing, and it's unfolded by Jesus in this teaching, which is in fact in John's gospel, his last public address which John records for us, and incredibly, we have it here in the palms of our hands in the Holy Bible, the Word of God written. And so I've got five marks of, what could we call them, authentic Christianity, which we can learn from Jesus in John chapter 10. I believe you'll find it helpful to have your Bibles open at our gospel passage, John chapter 10, as we look at these together. They're not all original to me, but I hope you'll find them as impacting as I do. Here's the first one, and I've called it intimacy. A Christian is a person who has entered into a relationship with God through his son, Jesus. It's very personal, and it's a very intimate relationship, isn't it? In the book of Psalms, when David talked of the Lord as my shepherd, he, as he does in Psalm 23, it was startling because suddenly the relationship between God and human beings had become personal. He's my shepherd, and it's intimate. As many of you know, uh, and as evidenced by my strong North American accent, uh, I grew up in New Zealand a population of just under 5 million people who are surrounded by just over 27 million sheep. That's 5.6 sheep for every person. In fact, the, uh, the national flock has dropped a lot in New Zealand recently. But I've watched shepherds drive huge flocks of hundreds, many hundreds of sheep across pastures and down roads. And for, for many of us urban dwellers, we need to think of ourselves into that metaphor of the Good Shepherd for just a moment. The first century sheep rearing wasn't so much about barking dogs and quad bikes and whistling and vast flocks spread over hillsides and tagged airs and sheep drenching and dye on the side of fleeces and all those sorts of things. It was much more intimate and personal. 
sheep in the first century were kept mainly for wool, mainly, and not for meat. So they tended to be around most of their lives. They were kept in small numbers, flocks of perhaps 20 or 30. You see this even in Israel today. And the shepherd knew them. And he gave them little names like long ears or white nose, picking up some of their characteristics and, and made them uh, their relationship very personal. To lose even one was to suffer a serious economic blow where every single sheep in your flock counted and it was important. Look at verse 4 in our Bibles in John chapter 10. They know his voice, the voice of the good shepherd. It's lovely. It's a lovely picture. Verse 14, I know my own and my own know me. And he leads them out and there's recognition. And it's a beautiful picture of the true relationship between God and his children. They hear his voice and he calls them by their name. He calls them by name. Jake -a Yang Yang, he says, you follow me. David Lawrence, he says, you follow me. Laurie Lewis, you follow me. Pam Wilkes, you follow me. And you do it personally, intimately, loved by God, the good shepherd, because you are precious and important to him, and he knows you by name. That's extraordinary, is it not? You, me, insignificant sheep in a worldwide human race of almost 7 billion people on one small planet in a small galaxy in a vast universe, and the creator knows us by name. It's very moving. But there are also warnings in these verses, and it's important we look at them. Do you see there in the words of Jesus? Look back in the very first verse of John chapter 10. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, I've noticed when Jesus says that, we need to sit up and take notice. He says, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. Each town or village in Bible days had its own sheep pen within the secure walls and the gate under the control of a sort of night watchman into which many of the owners would put their sheep before returning to collect them again the following morning. And then the shepherd would go to the gate, look verse 3, go to the door, and the sheep would listen for the voice of the shepherd. And the shepherd would call them by name, those characteristic names, his own sheep, and they would hear his voice. They wouldn't follow the voice of a stranger. That's verse 5. Do you see it there? They would follow their own shepherd. It's a lovely picture. So how do we learn the voice of Jesus, the good shepherd? How do we discern his voice from the voice of the stranger? Well, I'm so glad you asked. I could hear all of your questions this morning. No, I couldn't, but many of you are laughing as I say it. We do so, don't we? We learn the voice of the Lord by reading the Bible, by studying it, by memorizing it. Can you remember the first time you memorized Psalm 23? Weren't you able to say it from memory with Father Stan this morning as he read it? The Lord is my shepherd, therefore I shall not be in want. And we memorized the voice. We heard the voice of the Lord as we memorized his scripture and his words. And as we do, we come in tune with the voice of Jesus. It's like sharpening the dial on those old radios. Who gives us our direction? It comes from Jesus. We, we hear his voice and we learn it. We have a compass that points true north towards Jesus. Discerning the voice of God is, is not about, it's not about feeling warm fuzzies in our tummies that give us a sense of what we're supposed to do. That, that's not good spiritual discernment. When the Bible talks about spiritual discernment, as it does, for example, in Hebrews chapter 5, it distinguishes those who are only accustomed to milk from those who eat strong meat. 
It's those who have their senses exercised, discerning between good and evil, not just staying with the milk, but feasting on the meat of God's word. That's how we discern with certainty the voice of Jesus. The more we read the Bible, the more we become accustomed to his voice. I said last week when I was with the people of God at St. George's Helmetta that the Anglican homilies of the 16th century Reformation described the Bible as the word of God, as food for our souls. And the homily on scripture claims that, and I quote, it's wonderful, listen, as drink is pleasant to them that be dry and meat to them that be hungry, so is the reading, hearing, searching, and studying of Holy Scripture to them that be desirous to know God and to do His will. To know His voice requires us to cultivate and discern and study the Word of God, to be taught and illuminated by God the Holy Spirit. So, do not be conformed to this world with all its alluring voices, but as Romans 12 says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So the sheep know his voice, the voice of the good shepherd. He calls them by name. Here's the first point. It's very, very intimate and personal. Here's the next one. Look, the second distinguishing characteristic in verse 3 is direction. Look with me in that verse. He who enters the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. In the end of verse 4, he goes before them. And the sheep follow, for they know his voice. See, that's why we don't get ahead of God. We don't want to run ahead of him. He goes before us, and we follow. Come follow me, Jesus said to the disciples. The authentic Christian follows Jesus, and we follow him how? In obedience. None of us want to live life without direction any more than any of us want to live life without intimacy. And the source in each case is the same. It's Jesus, the good shepherd. Who do you consider to be your life authority? How do you make decisions? How do you decide between right and wrong? You, someone else, Jesus, at one level, it's, it's not flat, flattering, is it, to be compared to sheep, woolly, mindless, helpless animals, and yet it's a fair picture of fallen human beings, and we need the shepherding of Jesus, and he graciously provides it. Of course, this life is, is not always straightforward. There are always competing voices. There are different themes pressing in on us, calling us away from that single-mindedness of following Jesus. There were, in fact, competing voices in Jesus' day. The competing voices of the strangers and the thieves and the robbers of verses 1 and verses 8. Do you see that? The people offering today what they offered then, the political solutions, the, the materialistic solutions, the sexual solutions, the violent solutions. And then there's the offers of all the new religions in one form or another, offering a freedom which ultimately is, is ultimately illusory and which ends in destruction and disappointment. This is why Jesus is so very careful to draw the contrast between the true shepherds and the false shepherds. Do you notice that? He is saying in essence to us, you must be aware of the imposters. They're all around us. But the true shepherd takes responsibility to defend the sheep. He will defend the sheep against the wolves. He will defend the sheep against those who would steal them, the robbers and the others, the fake imposters who do not go through the door, those who would come at night and scale over the wall or get over the fence and then get in among the sheep and steal a lamb and hoist it over the wall and take it away. What does Jesus say about them? Verse 1, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, 
but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. This is very important. Our Lord is severely rebuking, as he often does throughout the Gospels, the leaders who use their positions for their own profit rather than benefit the benefit of the Lord's people, and they falsely teach the people of God. You know, there are many threats to Christianity today, aren't there? Communism, Islam, materialism, individualism, pandemics, and many others, but they are all a pittance to the false teachers of the gospel. You know, not everyone who thumps their Bible and says, Jesus loves you, is to be trusted. And what is the response to these imposters? What's our response to these thieves, these robbers? Look at verse 5. We are to, do you notice? Flee from them. Not listen to them. Not spend time entertaining them. Later in the New Testament, we're told not even to invite them into our homes. Jesus says here, flee from them. Flee from them as you would when you run away from a wolf. And this is so very important because when Bible teaching and when preachers go bad, so too do hearts and minds and eternal destinies. That's why all of this matters. But my brothers and sisters this morning, enter only through the door of Christ the Good Shepherd. There is only one way, one gate, one door for the sheep, one source for our direction, one route through which he alone delivers the freedom we long for. And that route is Christ. He is the door. Look, verse 7. Look with me, verse 9. And the authentic Christian finds him or herself saying, amidst all those competing voices, I am committed to following one shepherd and listening to one voice and obeying one Lord. Is that you? Can you say, yes, I know intimacy. I've entered into a relationship with Christ. Second, I've got direction because I recognize Jesus as Lord and I'm committed to going his way. Thirdly, look. The third mark of authentic Christianity, it's there in verse 10. I came, said Jesus. Wonderful words, aren't they? I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Is that how you would describe your Christian relationship with Christ? The third distinguishing mark is fulfillment. How many of our contemporaries have rejected Christianity because they've con they're convinced it's untrue? And not only are they convinced it's untrue, they simply believe they've, and, and they've been given the distinct impression that it's dull or it's restricted. That somehow life will be narrower and less enjoyable. That when you become a Christian, Jesus shuts you in and limits your freedom and takes away your fulfillment. Of course, all of that is a lie. Jesus says the opposite. He says, I've come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Now, I'm not advocating the health and wealth type of Christianity, which is so popular in our nation. That Christianity is the Christianity of the false shepherds. Being a Christian isn't the end of problems or pressure. Of course not. We all know that. But there is an unmistakable shift in perception and experience when we turn to Christ. The colors of life seem sharper, don't they? The joys seem deeper. The sorrows, well, they seem somehow more manageable. The relationships are richer. And Jesus promises and guarantees life to the full for those who follow him. It's the fullness of love, forgiveness, and freedom that is only fully found in Christ and in Christ alone. And Jesus calls his followers not to endure lifeless, miserable existence that squashes our potential, but to a rich and full and joyful life. One overflowing with meaningful activities under the personal favor and blessing of Christ, the Good Shepherd. It's wonderful. 
If the first mark is intimacy, a relationship with Jesus as friend and brother, and the second mark is direction, submitting to Jesus as Lord, the third mark being fulfillment, the fulfillment of love and forgiveness and freedom, then the fourth mark is security, guaranteed by the Savior. And it's there in verse 8. Will you have a look with me in John chapter 10? If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Kept safe, literally. It's developed in that wonderful verse, verse 11, perhaps the verse to take away and meditate on today. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. We tend to rather sentimentalize the good shepherd picture, don't we? The sort of airbrushed, very handsome Jesus, bearded with a crozier and cuddly lambs over his arm. But first century shepherding was hard and dusty and dirty and sweaty and dangerous work. Sacrifices had to be made. And all that would have resonated with Jesus' hearers. This wasn't the blue-eyed Scandinavian Jesus that we see in our stained grass pictures of John chapter 10. This was the rugged, self-sacrificing shepherd of the first century. Those listening to Jesus wouldn't have missed the messianic significance of Jesus referring to himself as the good shepherd. He said, I am the shepherd and I've come to lead Israel to freedom. Nobody would have minded if he had said that and stopped there. But then he went on to link his messianic uh, uh, shepherding to sacrifice and giving of his life, laying down his life. That was strange to their ears. It said alarm bells ringing that somehow didn't seem right. But Jesus' shepherding was to be different. Unlike the imposters, the false shepherds who had come before, whose violence had resulted in lives being taken, Jesus was going to give his life for others. Glance down to verse 18 in John chapter 10. Look with me. I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Notice that phrase, lay it down. In fact, Jesus uses it three times in verse 11, then 15, and then 18. All the others betray their sheep, but Jesus lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus' death is supremely a saving death for the sheep, and being saved if you're a sheep is only necessary, isn't it, if you're in some sort of danger. And so many people today do not recognize the danger. They're addictively lured by false shepherds and applaud their false teaching. And there is no recognition of the eternal danger that awaits human beings without Christ. That's why we share the gospel. You see, you can reject the friendship of God. You can decide to go your own way, to go your own direction. You can make do with the life you have. Many of us do. But all of those choices will have consequences. We all die and we all have to face the judgment seat of Christ. The Son of God, the Lamb of God, the Good Shepherd dies so that you and I can be rescued, eternally safe and secure. Intimacy with God, direction under His Lordship, fulfillment by Christ's Spirit, security eternally through Christ's death. Well, I've just got a few moments for my final thread here. Look, unity with all of God's people. Look quickly with me in verse 16. In that reference, do you see it? To the other sheep, not of the sheep pen. Who are they? Jesus says at the end of that verse, there will be one flock and one shepherd. And here is a beautiful glimpse isn't it? Beyond Israel, to the Gentile church, to Bishop Seabury, to Christchurch, to, to all of us, to the tens of millions of people down through the ages, to the first two millennia who have fallen under the irresistible love of Jesus Christ, who have heard his voice 
and who through his sacrificial death have been drawn into the life and vitality of his kingdom. One flock, one shepherd. Again, brothers and sisters, if you find yourself unexcited and unmoved and unaffected by the breathtaking privilege of being part of the multi-ethnic, multicultural, worldwide family of Christ called the church, then it may be, it may be, you have yet to discover authentic Christianity. Will you this morning at Bishop Seabury and at Christ Church, and if you're joining us online from other places, reflect on these truths. Intimacy. Do you see your relationship with God as intimate, known by He who calls you by name? Direction. Have you resolved to make obedience to Christ, the Good Shepherd's voice, your life direction? Fulfillment. Have you begun to taste the personal fulfillment produced uniquely by Christ's Spirit working in you? Are you allowing Him to do that? Do you want Him to do that, really? Security. Are you sure? Sure. Your sins have been forgiven by Christ the Good Shepherd who laid down His life for you. Unity. Are you excited? Excited? to be a full member of the one worldwide flock of Christ called the church. Let us pray. O God, whose Son Jesus Christ is the good shepherd of your people, grant that when we hear his voice, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Bishop, for that very powerful word. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world saying, hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and the unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our, our prayer. prayer. 
for a Foley, our Archbishop, and Julian, our Bishop, for Father Stan and Father Jay, your priests, for Art, your deacon, and for all clergy of the diocese and for the congregation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our, Hear our prayer. prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others, especially the Petersons. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, especially those in northern Nigeria and northern India, throughout the Middle East and China. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For our nation and for those in authority and for all in public service, especially Donald, our president. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially John Poffett, Joe Bell, Brett Primitt, Eleanor and Eric Hayward, Beth, and all those who are on our prayer list and on the prayer list of Holy Trinity and Christ Church Brantford. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our, our prayer. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, especially Eileen, think in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. I'd like to offer a prayer of deliverance from the coronavirus. Uh, this is by Pete Gregg in 24-7. It's a prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we ask you to protect us from the spread of the coronavirus. You are powerful and merciful. Let this be our prayer. Have, Have mercy, mercy on me, my God. God. Have, Have mercy, mercy on me. For in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. Jehovah Shalom, God of peace. We remember those living in coronavirus hotspots and those currently in isolation. May they know your presence in their isolation, your peace in their turmoil, and your patience in their waiting. Prince of Peace, you are powerful and merciful. Let this be their prayer. May your mercy come quickly to meet us, for we are in desperate need. Help us, God our Savior, for the glory of your name. God of all comfort and counsel, we pray for those who are grieving, reeling from the sudden loss of loved ones. May they find your fellowship in their suffering your comfort in their loss, and your hope in their despair. We name, those, we name you those known to us who are vulnerable and scared, the frail, the sick, and the elderly. God of all comfort, you are powerful and merciful. May this be our prayer. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. Jehovah Rapha, God who heals. We pray for all medical professionals dealing daily with the intense pressures of this crisis. Grant them resilience and weariness, discernment and diagnosis, 
and compassion upon compassion as they care. We thank you for the army of researchers working steadily and quietly towards a cure. Give them clarity, serendipity, and unexpected breakthrough today. Would you rise above this present darkness as the sun of righteousness with healing in your rays? May this be our prayer. Sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth. By your great power and outstretched arm, nothing is too hard for you. God of all wisdom, we pray for our leaders, the World Health Organization, national governments and local leaders too, heads of schools, hospitals, and other institutions. Since you have positioned these people in public service for this hour, we ask you to grant them wisdom beyond their own wisdom to contain this virus, faith beyond their own faith to fight this fear, and strength beyond their own strength to sustain vital institutions through this time of turmoil. God of all wisdom and counsel, you are powerful and merciful. May this be our prayer. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. I bless you with the words of Psalm 91. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. May El Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty who loves you, protect you. May Jesus Christ, his Son who died for you, save you. And may the Holy Spirit who broods over the chaos and fills you with his presence intercede for you and in you for others at this time. The Lord, Lord will, will rescue, rescue me from, from every, every evil attack, attack and, and will bring, bring me safely to his, his heavenly kingdom. kingdom. To, to him be glory forever and ever. And ever. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, Grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we, we confess, confess that, that we, we have, have sinned against, against you in, in thought, word, and deed, by, by what, what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world 
to save sinners. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. My brothers and sisters, may the peace, may the peace of the Lord be always with you and with your spirit. Turn and greet one another with a sign of God's peace. Say hello to one another in the chat room. Send each other text messages, but greet one another with a sign of the Lord's peace. If you're at home, go ahead and come back and find your seats. It's so odd to, to kind of say it that way, but wherever you are, let's gather back together. Um, just a reminder, as you're able, if you're able to participate and continue to give and support the work of the church, uh, your support is, um, is most welcome and greatly appreciated during this time. Um, also know that many of you are facing many financial challenges and difficulties at this time, and we continue to pray for you and let us continue to pray for one another. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I appeal to you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship.
greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O Lord. And of your own have we given you. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly, we are bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was offered for us and has taken away the sin of the world, who by his death has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper... Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died, Christ, Christ is risen, Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also 
that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ our Passover Lamb has been sacrificed once for all upon the cross. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia! We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us thy peace. My brothers and sisters, behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who were invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given for you, preserve your body and soul to everlasting life. Take and eat and feed on them in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. At this time, our bishop, Bishop Julian, will lead all of us, who are those of you who are at home, uh, in the prayer for spiritual communion. Will you pray with me? Dear Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to possess you within my soul. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you together with all your faithful people gathered around your holy table at Bishop Seabury Church. And I embrace you with all the affections of my soul. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen.
Ace, this is the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Take this remembrance that Christ died for you and be thankful. Abby, this is the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Take and eat and remember that Christ died for you and be thankful. Dave, this is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Take and eat and remember that Christ died for you and be thankful. Let us pray together the post-communion prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we thank, thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Before uh, the benediction, before the blessing, just got a few announcements to share with everyone, just a couple. Again, I uh, want to welcome everyone who uh, is participating in our online worship service. Um, it's not just us at Bishop Seabury gathering together, but it's also our brothers and sisters from Christ Church Anglican. And also we have, uh, starting next week, we'll be having Holy Trinity uh, in Plainville joining us for our weekly uh, worship service online as we continue in this posture uh, that they're in. And as things change and, and develop over the course of the next few weeks, we will keep you regularly informed and regularly updated. Uh, and we'll also continue to, um, to minister uh, in this format, ministering and reaching out and, and online. Um, the announcements are in our weekly email newsletter. We're now sending out an uh, email newsletter uh, usually on, on late Tuesday evening, and then we usually send another one out on Friday. And that keeps uh, a regular and steady flow of information that we hope and pray is getting out to you. We're also sharing a lot of that information on social uh, media. So if you want to know the latest of what's going on at Bishop Seabury, certain events, certain gatherings, take a look regularly or look it up on Facebook. Um, did share this past week, uh, inviting many of you to join in using the devotional app Lectio 365. Um, encourage you to use that. The focus between now and Pentecost is how to pray. Uh, we've been using Pete Gregg's book, How to Pray, over the last few weeks, even before uh, Lent. We're doing the prayer course on Wednesday evenings. Um, and even if you haven't taken the prayer course or you haven't been reading the book on how to pray, uh, it's a great time to jump in and pick up Lectio 365 and use that daily devotion. Um, and I'm just asking that if you do do it, that you do it through uh, the day of Pentecost. And if you want to continue using that devotional app afterwards, that's great. But the invitation for our congregation is to join with me and others 
um, in using Lectio 365 until Pentecost. Um, the prayer course is going to have session eight this Wednesday. It's the last of the eight sessions of the prayer course, but we will continue to meet on Wednesday nights in a form of Bible study, in a form of prayer, gathering together for prayer. And uh, so I want to encourage you, don't feel like because you weren't at session one or any of the preceding sessions of the prayer course that you can't jump in at any time. And this invitation is extended not just to us here at Bishop Seabury, but to folks at Christ Church and to, to folks at, at Holy Trinity. And no matter where you're at, feel free to chime in, and the link is provided um, on, our, on our website. Uh, next Saturday uh, would have been our normal men's breakfast at 8 a.m. We're going to make an attempt next Saturday at a virtual men's brunch. Notice brunch. We're going to start it a little bit later next Saturday morning, so be on the lookout for information on that. Then the following week, we're looking into a women's brunch. <coughs> Uh, virtual brunch. So you get your own brunch together, log in on Zoom, and connect with uh, your fellow parishioners for the men's brunch and for the women's brunch. And, and I can't stress enough how grateful I am to all of you, and um, how grateful I am for particularly for all of the people who make this happen. Grateful for Father Stan and the ministry he does behind the scenes. I'm grateful for Mace and Dave and, and Abby, Noah, just Gene, everybody who's, who is serving uh, regularly behind the scenes, uh, for Dana, for April, members of the vestry who are committed to making sure the a regular and steady flow of information is, is getting out to you. So I'm truly uh, grateful and thankful and can't wait for the opportunity for us to gather once again in person. And, and now just prepare yourselves. That might look different, okay? That might look different from how we're expecting it to be. So just be on the lookout for some information. And, and if, if you need anything from us, you need some assistance, uh, you need some help getting some groceries, um, please do not hesitate to reach out. Call the church. We check the phones daily. Send an email to office at Seabury Anglican. We want to remain connected to you. Um, Bishop, you still out there? Um, before, you, um, before the benediction and the blessing, do you have any other words you'd like to share with us? I think you're looking particularly sharp today, Father Jay, uh, in that chasuble that matches the holy table. Uh, very, very impressive. And uh, greetings to you all from Brenda and me and from our churches across the diocese who are all meeting, just like Bishop Seabury is, uh, online in various circumstances tonight. Hopefully I'll be uh, electronically with um, our, our Church of the Resurrection in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and so, so grateful uh, to all of you uh, for your ministry. Uh, I know that members of my family are with us today, my daughter Frances, my son Sam, and daughter-in-law Paige. And I noticed too that my assistant Phil Shade and our diocesan secretary Barbara have uh, joined us today. So God bless you and keep you. Let's pause now as we ask God's blessing. And now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. 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 Water, earth, and sky. The heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy.
when I stumble in the darkness. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. Alleluia.